We're up to uh, 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6. We're finishing that epistle, and uh, it's been uh, one of those uh, epistles that really tie us together with understanding how is this message con uh, inculcated, communicated, conveyed, taught, uh, transmitted uh, in, from life to life, because we, you and I, are the product of an unbroken succession of one changed life and then another and then another. And you don't know the people who prayed for you, the people who've been involved in your formation. It'd be a lot of surprises when you see what's happened and how the hidden impact of many uh, lives will shape our own destinies as well. But we are privileged to have these resources and we go back to the first century and we can see it, this unbroken pattern. This, this theme, just as a reminder of this um, re remarkable epistle, is um, it's effectively a leadership manual. It's Timothy's organization and oversight of the Asian churches and the, the central church was Ephesus out of, out of which he was um, ministering and the order of deacons and elders and so forth. And so it really is a leadership manual in many respects to encourage and exhort Timothy. And it's very practical, very personal. And he kind of bounces around from topic to topic because he's considering by the spirit, what are the things that Timothy needs to have uh, as he's processing his own uh, responsibilities as um, a, a kind of a legate of, uh, of the apostle. And to, you need to be an example. So it's, a, it's an epistle that we all need for encouragement and exhortation. And we need to be stimulated to actually stay in the race, to run the race with uh, endurance, and to exercise our spiritual gifts. And Paul was in, inviting him to make sure that you use all that you've been called to do and to fulfill the ministry. And that's going to be true of all of us. I think it, all of us need to continue to be an example wherever we are in our season in life so that we become incarnations of the truth. So you become the word becomes flesh and that uh, then dwells among us. The idea of Christ in you, the hope of glory. The fact that the, what, that the indwelling Christ is really now you were in him and he is in you gives you the possibility and the power to uh, live a life that demands an explanation. And so as we walk in greater, greater dependence upon that, we need one another as well for that actual process. So we encourage, we stimulate one another. So as we listen in on this council, we're privileged to listen in to what Paul is actually saying, kind of over his shoulder. What would he convey? What are the things that matter most? And so his passion for the gospel, for the integrity of the truth is uh, remarkable. And so he's encouraging uh, Timothy not to be fearful. He knows his weaknesses and he's encouraging him to, uh, to, be, to be straightforward and uh, forthright and to use what he's called to be uh, using for the good fight of the faith. We're all in a warfare. All of us are in a spiritual warfare, the world, the flesh, the devil, but we can see that we have the resources that have been required for our own life and, and, uh, and growth. To live a quality of life that's beyond reproach is one of the things he wants Timothy to be. So as a man who cannot be reproached for his uh, character and to deal uh, as well with a lot of very specific little issues, as we're going to see in this last chapter. Uh, it's very specific matters, but are, that they, they do really matter because the refutation of error by conveying the truth is essential. So again, it's an epistle that talks about the beauty of the gospel and the goodness of, of who God is and what uh, the truth is about. So to refute the error is to convey the truth. So the way we do this then is to be, have a positive sense of what is what is this that we believe? What are we pursuing? What are we for what are, rather than what we're against? And again, you want to be known for what you love, for what you're pursuing, rather than what you're opposed to. And because then we have a positive perspective on understanding how God is the author of history, space and time, and therefore everything works together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we realize we're here for a purpose. There's going to be error in our times as there always has been. And so new, new variations and old, old, old heresies. To, but the way you refute the error is by conveying the truth. And by staying with that truth, in spite of the fact that it's countercultural and counterintuitive in many times, so more and more we find that people are tending to be tempted to become more relevant in the name of relevance than to become diminished in their actual integrity of the gospel. 
So it's a very dangerous thing for us to pursue. Um, so as I say, it's a leadership manual. It is a way of seeing what a leader is. And a leader, you remember, is a person who is a, a steward. Uh, and he's, he's, he's a, when we think about leadership as, as such, I think about this concept of um, leadership as three components. The, uh, the idea of he's a steward, and that's his perspective, that he sees, again, that he has been given these things, but he owns nothing. The steward understands that you own nothing, you bring nothing to the table. All that you are, all that you have is gift and grace, and understanding that then. But a steward will be held accountable to the master, so it's, it's required of a steward that one be faithful. But as a shepherd, then there's also that component. That's the people that you've been entrusted with and the position you've been granted. And a shepherd, as you know, would guide the, she the sheep. They would feed them and protect them. And so that by the same token, we have been granted people in our lives and ministries that we can con contribute to, participate in, and serve. But the way we do that is by practice. The servant leadership model, then, is the way we actually express that. So your perspective is you own nothing. You are on the responsibility uh, to manage the affairs of another and the resources of another. You've been granted that God has given you specific people in your arena of influence for a purpose and that you have to look around and why have I been embedded in this context? Because that's where you're meant to flourish, your gifts, your capacities, and your, your, your basically your vocation, your work becomes in a context for that. And then you practice uh, leadership and, and through the process of stewardship in that way. And so when I think about this concept of, of, the, of being a leadership manual, then uh, he is telling him, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you are to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. This is in chapter three. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in, glo in glory. This is kind of an early coda that was used to summarize this mystery of the good news this, of, this, of the gospel of grace. Another text that's critical is, you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. We're going to be seeing this in, in today's uh, chapter. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal, on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So there's a strong sense of personal entrusting and, and exhortation. So in chapter 3, he talked about the need for leadership of the elders and the deacons and um, the uh, not not a, not a question of worldly success or position, but rather the qualities that come from our character and our walk with God, and you, the person you are when no one's looking. So as, essentially, you become a person who is being nurtured and groomed by the living God. And so, what you are in the small places, this, everything matters. So he was righteous. Who is who is righteous in a very little thing will be righteous in much. He was unrighteous in a very little thing will be unrighteous in much because good and evil both increase at compound interest, as C.S. Lewis put it, which means that little acts of fidelity or infidelity will matter. They'll, they'll shape us so that your integrity, having an examination and having the accountability of others, but also openness to the prompts of the spirit as well to make those mid-course adjustments as necessary so we become people of, of character. So again, this is a personal letter uh, but it has rich principles for us 2,000 years later. Again, I'm astonished when I look at a, a epistle of this, old, this age and I realize the scriptures then have lessons of life that are timeless, they're eternal, they're messages that even though they were contextualized in that setting, they have relevance for us in all settings. And it, so he then talks about the assumption of doctrine, because here it's not a doctrinal teaching, it's really, he already knows that Timothy has been with him and knows these truths. Now his life is to be manifesting those truths and to reveal that, to the outworking of what God has inworked. So the idea of work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God who's at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. So your life in this world is an outworking of his inworking. 
it's effectively you're becoming more and more in your practice who you are in your position. So these, these ideas, it's a trust, trustworthy statement that he uses in, this, uh, in these pastoral epistles. It's a trustworthy statement, common sayings and confessions. And so I wanna, I'm going to pick up with, uh, with Christ in a moment and see where that comes from, uh, where, where he uh, discusses the lordship and the nature of what it means to be in Christ. Uh, so let's pick up and see. So again, again, the chapters, they were in the verses, were not in the original. So we just continue. He's dealing with a wide array of topics, even not, not about his own uh, little, uh, having a little wine for your stomach and your pre pretty personal stuff, you see. Um, and then he jumps to this, the, uh, the deeds that are good are quite evident, those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. At the end of the day, it will be revealed. It'll, what is concealed will be known. And so who you are um, will become manifest in your way, relations with others. And you can't sin in a vacuum because it'll affect you eventually. And nor can you be righteous in a vacuum. There'll be a quality about you that manifests the quality of Christ, the character of Christ. Now, we start off with these instructions um, for those who are under the yoke as slaves. You remember about, estimates vary, about half, the, half of the Roman Empire, it's estimated, were um, slaves. And it was a different system than we might now suppose, but still, there was a system in which they, uh, the, this, the New Testament doesn't formally or specifically um, refute slavery, but it pro provides the context in which it would be eventually defeated. And it is really through the gospel. It was by the, by, uh, the really many years um, uh, that there was no slavery in Europe. So there was a period of time for, and then it, re it returned with the, with the new world. But uh, it was Christianity that really led to the end of slavery for centuries and centuries until it re re uh, sadly returned. And then it was again Christianity, Wilberforce and others who were opposed to it and ultimately brought back that freedom. But in that context, he's saying, don't take advantage of the fact that this is a fellow brother. He's saying that, that those who have believers as their masters must not, not be dis dis disrespectful because they're brethren. Just because they are brothers in Christ, you still need to serve them with, with integrity and care and serve them all the more, in fact, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and they're beloved. So he tells them to teach and practice these principles. In other words, there's often times when I find that Christians suppose that they're going to get some kind of a more grace than other, you know, after all, you're going to give me a discount or this, that, and the other, and they presume upon grace. And it's a mistake that that's, that's made. So he says, deal with your, with your work with integrity and character. Do it as unto the Lord, because it's the Lord Christ whom we serve. So it's not a matter of really being focused on who um, we are, but rather who he is, and then allowing that to become uh, critical in our lives. Teach and preach these principles. He th he's now speaking about the fact that there are not a lot of false teachers that were going around, and they had various... Um, uh, we, we can only guess in some aspects what they were talking about. He speaks about this different doc doctrine and um, some of these things that they, that they mentioned which cause strife. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, which are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's conceited and understands nothing. He's referring then to false teachers who at that, in that area were uh, focused on controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and a constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So they're actually trying to manipulate um, and find their place so that they can use this for personal aggrandizement. So there were a, no a number of people who were uh, conceited, who had these crazy notions that you need to have my teaching and that's why um, this becomes a source of, of constant strife and friction rather than unity in that diversity. So as a result of that, they were are doing this in part because they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So they were using the gospel, peddling it in a certain way, in a way that lacked integrity. He said in his perspective is this in verse 7, and this is a pretty critical text for us to consider. He said, we have brought nothing into the world. That's pretty clear. So we can't take anything out of it as well. 
That's why I, and I like to put it, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. The fact is, what you, you go in, your in, in and you go out and you have nothing with you. Um, at the end, we realize that this, uh, this life then is such that we, we can send something ahead though, even though we can't, we can't leave anything, or hold on to things, yet we can actually build into relationships that will last forever. So that's the perspective. But he, he gives a pretty low baseline to the men, mindset of contentment. If we have food and covering, with these we will be content. Interesting uh, baseline indeed, because when you think about what contentment is, the secret of contentment, we've talked about this before, is the idea of comparison, which is the enemy of contentment. Whenever you compare, there'll always be something who, someone's further down the road or someone who's uh, below you. And so either way, though, it leads to, to folly. But comparison leads, can lead to covetousness because you're now looking at a deficiency modality. If, if who determines the content of your life? Is it yourself or is it Christ? And if it's yourself, the vehicle you're going to use to determine how you're doing is to look around and see how your others are doing. So if everyone's riding a bicycle and you have a VW bug, then you're doing really well. You see, and you can see the relative uh, mindset. It all depends on the situation. But you see, someone else has uh, something better than me, and you become, uh, you have a, a lack, a, a mindset, you need more because, uh, and then after a while, it can lead to unfelt, unhealthy forms of competition and even the moral compromise to gain what you think you so richly deserve. It's a natural process. The amazing thing is, though the culture has changed, we don't. The human condition is still the same. Technologies and all kinds of approaches to life and culture are varying. But at the same time, the fact is human character, human nature, is something that is uh, the result of being the bearers of the Imago Dei. And though fallen, we still have uh, these natural patterns that we need to understand. And there's an option we have that we uh, that previously didn't have. Now that we're in Christ, we can now just let him determine. If I allow Jesus to determine the content of my life, I will be content. Why? Because he gives me what he knows I need. And he will not give me my greeds, but he'll give me my needs. And so we see that he will sustain us according to his vision of what we need. Although we, if we're not careful, we will be uncontent. We will have a lack of contentment. But you see, if we realize that he loves you and has your best interests at heart, um, even though you don't have, don't have what you want, you realize that he is going to pursue and give you what you need. And he's going to protect you and care for you even in these times. And there's going to be ups and downs, we know. But at the end of the day, we have to entrust ourselves to him uh, for our, our, our life and destiny. If he's given me, I can be content because he's made me competent. He's given me what I need in order to flourish in this world. And as a result, if, if he's the one who gives me what I need, and if my, I define contentment by him rather than myself, then I know that he has, I'm competent, he's given me what I need for my ministry, and I can therefore focus on other people, not having to try to, to, to fight others to get my needs, but actually I can serve other people and be compassionate, which leads then to the development of character. And you'll see a, a contrast in the, on the horizontal level as well, which is um, another way of looking at this material. So if I see it this way, you see um, comparison versus contentment. They're, they're, again, they're, one's the opposite. Covetousness, I don't have, but I do have. So it's a, a deficiency versus a sufficiency mindset. I think that's absolutely essential that we have a sufficiency mindset. Instead of competition, it's compassion. Instead of compromise, it's character. So you can see the radical differences that this makes in the uh, life of a believer. So we, can, we continue on and we see then he says, that the love of money, those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires. But by the way, did you notice the baseline of contentment? A little bit lower than you might have guessed. Food and covering. And even there, sometimes Paul was without those, you see. But he learned the secret of contentment, as he tells the Philippians. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. 
And then he says the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. It's not the root of all evil, but it is a root of all sorts of evil. And this, this love has a way of ca causing people to wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. So there is this idea of how we want to have the wrong desires and pursue things that God is not wanting us to have at this point. And so you're going after a thing rather than going after Christ. But he invites them to flee from these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So replace those behaviors, those attitudes, with the quality of Christ's likeness. What does that look like in you? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to be righteousness. It's going to be godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness, the quality of, of Christ's likeness. To fight the good fight, you're in a, in a warfare. To take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the pre presence of many witnesses. So he gives this charge in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Live today in light of that day, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, and dwells in unapproachable life whom no man has seen or can see. To be him be honor and eternal dominion. That's a pretty strong statement. Very, very high Christology. So you can see that you have a vision of Christ that's uh, quite glorious, going back to this understanding of Christ in, 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 in 1 Timothy. You can see him as the mediator between God and man in chapter 2. He's the one mediator. I know of no other salvation, no other Savior. He's the only one who offered himself for us. Moreover, he is the one who was manifested in the flesh in chapter 3, uh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. We see as well in chapter 1 that he's the source of spiritual strength, of faith, and of love. It's, it's a very Christocentric epistle. He came into the world to save sinners. And so we see that he himself gave himself as a ransom for all, the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And so we see this picture of Christ, how he is the one who is the, uh, who gives us all that we need and all that is necessary for life and godliness. When I think of Jesus then, um, who do you say that I am? That question I, now you know I often ask. I sometimes use this little chart, this little image. I think we've given it to you before. But sometimes I can just zoom into this. He's the savior of the world. I can just almost randomly choose this. He's the root of Jesse. He is uh, God's dear son. He is the source of our propitiation. He's the last uh, Adam. He is the way, he is the judge, the counselor, the captain of salvation. So the more I think about him and remember who he is, what he's done for us, the more I can then respond to him, I'm not trying to work up a feeling, but rather to review who he is and all that he's, he's, he's uh, done for me. And that's a very powerful thing. He's the one who's going to bring about the, um, all these things. And ultimately, we wait for his coming. Immortality, it, unapproachable life. You, can't have never, you cannot see him or can see, not the glorified, resurrected Christ, but yet you will see him. One day you will see him face to face in your resurrected body. To see him now in his true unmediated glory, we would be blinded. You see, that's less mediation. You saw what happened with Saul on the road to Damascus. You saw what happened to John in uh, Revelation chapter 1, like falling his, on his feet like a dead man. And yet the amazing thing is that the one who is so distant is also so intimate, so, so close to us. So we can see that... Um, we have this whole treasure uh, that's hidden within us. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. He just nailed two things. Uh, that Money is not neutral. It has a gravity. It has a downward pull. And the more we have of it, uh, the more it can tend to pull us down. So the, one of the temptations with wealth is that the more we have, the more we're going to become, we're tempted to being arrogant, you see. And the second one is going to be putting your hope in your wealth rather than in Christ. A third one is it's harder to live by faith. But he's now identifying these things and saying, here's what you need to do. Be rich in good works. Be generous, ready to share. 
storing up for themselves a treasure of a good foundation for the future, that they, they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So these are powerful uh, principles. Um, in my book, uh, uh, Leverage, using, le using temporal wealth for eternal gain, uh, Russ Cross and I talk about this very matter of principles of, of biblical leverage, and that relates to some of these principles that are found um, here and in the rest of the scriptures. Why are we to give? When are we to give? How are we to give? How much are we to give? And where are we to give? And so then practices of accountability and other things like, like that. And so it becomes a very important thing. A few key pages that come to my mind here. Um, the more we give away our money, the, more, the easier it becomes to do so, spring-loading us toward giving rather than hoarding. Our natural downward pull will be hoarding. It's just the way we'll be. We want to curate the, and cultivate the pile, like Smog the dragon who just wanted to stay on top of it. Um, so this is the hardest thing for us, is to give with a warm hand rather than a cold hand. And uh, it's an interesting thing. We talk about this. God hates hoarding and loves lavish generosity. So to give with a warm hand, we discuss what that means then. To give, if you're giving while you're living, then you're knowing where it's going. You see, and uh, otherwise there's this danger of trying to control it from the grave. And that's a dangerous thing. And that's what people try to do with the control because they have another, it's a pile that they can continue, they suppose they can hoard and, and use. Uh, we talk about the uh, hoarding our resources during this life and only giving them away through our wills when we die stems partly from an illusion of control. We want to provide for ourselves while we're alive, finding temporary security and satisfaction. And so releasing it now demonstrates our trust that God will provide for our needs and our recognition that all wealth belongs to him in the first place. So these are very countercultural principles. But we grow in direct proportion to the risk we take in the service of God. And so we talk about that concept as well. The whole idea, the gravitational pull of wealth. And so to think in terms of kingdom metrics, um, if, I were, if I were to invest that, that wealth in other people. So this is why when we think about stewardship, then we think about this concept of time, talent, and treasure that are these are resources that we only have for a very brief moment. These truth, the truth and relationships, which are two other matters of stewardship, are going to endure forever. So the wisdom of this world would be to leverage that which is passing away, your time, your talent, your treasure, and to turn that into the currency of heaven by making friends for yourself by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, Luke 16, 9, so that when it fails, that's when you die, there'll be people to receive you into the eternal dwellings. Wouldn't it be smart then to actually do it in such a way that it actually will have an impact on people that will go on and on, a reverberating uh, impact uh, in the lives of others? So the more affluent bec we become, the more we need accountability to avoid serving money. So it's not a neutral thing, but it's a strong and, and powerful thing. So um, the, um, the idea of heavenly compounding, we talk about that. And we talk about reverse compounding. Uh, the future value of our giving declines every day as our time on earth lessens. And if we're holding on to why are you holding? You see, so it becomes a, a question of that. So we all have to wrestle with these, these principles. So we talk about the idea of, of current giving, helping God, keeping God in the throne instead of money, which constantly strives to ascend the throne. It's a natural pull that we have. And so we talk about that in, in that book because the need for us to realize that, the, that money can pull us down and, and redefine us if we're not careful. So it's a matter of understanding then your true treasure has got to be uh, heavenly and therefore um, not cultivating, curating the pile now, but rather something that is going to be um, invested in the lives of others. You do not know the incalculably powerful impact it can have on the lives of so many people when we do that. And then he ends this epistle with um, an exhortation to guard what's been entrusted to him, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing dark arguments of what's falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the face. So again, have the pursuit of knowing him, not just being proud of what you know, but who you know. It's the, it's the idea of really serving him, loving him, pursuing him, and, and knowing him.